Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and I don't know what this is from, but there are three clips that were put out yesterday, one by these Black Swan Capitalist guys and two by other people um, that were right over the target. I want you to watch these three clips. There needs to be a fundamental repricing of all things financial, almost everything, vis-a-vis. -vis. I hope, you, wait, is he saying like there needs to be a repricing as in like a price set? All things not financial, or at least to the extent they are financial, they're very, very explicitly backed by real assets unencumbered by debt and leverage. Mm -hmm. That's where we're going. That's the reset, if you want to call it that. Oh boy, That's, he's talking some controversial language. Here's another clip. We're in uncharted waters. Imagine the Titanic hitting an iceberg, but not knowing how deep the Atlantic was. It, it's it's truly unprecedented. And who knows exactly what's going to happen. And sadly, I have to answer your question now. Who knows on exactly what time horizon? Uh, sorry, what, what exactly? I, sorry, well, I, I was going to say, he was saying he's not sure the time horizon. It's true. It's a mug's game to predict a specific moment when things implode, to use sensational terms. But I would argue it's happening in real time right now. The evidence is all around us. I mean, many of your viewers are pretty sophisticated in understanding debt and currency markets and precious metals and, and, and rates and yields. But uh, I look at it again, what's happening in real time with central banks, what's happening in terms of real time with, uh, with the oil trade, what's happening in real time with de-dollarization. These were sensational themes just a couple of years ago, and now they're happening at rapid pace. You can't deny the simple fact that since 2014, the central banks have been dumping U.S. Treasuries net and stacking physical gold net. You can't deny that the de-dollarization theme, which became obvious from day one of the sanctions when you weaponized the world reserve currency, was going to be a seismic shift in currency markets and debt markets. That's been happening faster than even I and Grant Williams and Jim Rickards and, 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 and John probably could have predicted two years ago. But it, the writing was on the wall when you weaponize the world reserve currency. And what we're seeing now in the oil trade with the petrodollar, what we're seeing on the COMEX, there are seismic shifts happening already. When you have, you know, 20% of the petrodollar, basically the oil trade last year outside of US dollar, when you have 45 BRICS, you know, 45 countries and the BRICS plus countries rising in, in membership, including Saudi Arabia and the UAE, when you have 45 countries doing trade settlements outside of the US dollar, you know, when you see what's happening with the ruble and the yuan and what they're doing with the oil trade, what even Japan is doing now outside of the petrodollar. These are massive implications on the US dollar when you take away that synthetic demand from the petrodollar, when you look at what's happening in the COMEX market, the deliveries going out by day by day, all of these things are massive. And when you look at central banks dumping U.S. Treasuries consistently and stacking physical gold at record levels, these are massive changes right now. You could argue that we're already in real time seeing changes. And when you could argue that when the IMF was talking about CBDC in 2020, the height of the COVID crisis, and what's happening now with the number of countries adopting it or going towards it, or what the BIS is doing, there are major changes happening right now. When it becomes an actual uh-oh moment in the risk asset markets, we can talk about those markets too, but I would say that we're already seeing things that aren't sensational, they're actual, and they may have seemed sensational two years ago. But today, uh, the list is long and distinguished. And I think just what's happening in the COMEX and the petrodollar or what's happening with central bank stacking of physical gold is already extraordinary. All right. And then here's the final clip from this. I don't even know where this... Well, actually, um, maybe I, I can backtrack it to this. I'll go, I'll go find the full video, but they're just great clips. We could spend 20 minutes on rates. We could spend 20 minutes on central bank buying or, dis, or not buying of U.S. Treasuries. You could spend 20 minutes on de-dollarization and what the BRICs are doing to go around the marginal line of U.S. dollars. They're going through it. They're just going around it. You could spend 20 minutes on the oil markets. You could spend 20 minutes on the COMEX. But all of those things are seismically shifting right now in real time that affect the U.S. dollar and therefore a massive tailwind for gold, which is why gold is reaching all-time highs despite traditional 
headwinds. And I think, you know, and then you've also got the fact that you've got the Shanghai Gold Exchange creating its own moving average for gold outside of London and New York. You've got... That's what Andy Shackman has been talking about. The COMEX has been used since its inception to manipulate gold prices. We've, I don't think we've ever seen a real gold price since the 1971. Happening in the petrol dollar markets. You, you know, what's also fascinating is you can get guys like, you know, Peter Schiff and Larry Leppard arguing about Bitcoin or gold. You can get me and Brent Johnson arguing about whether the DXY goes higher or lower. But we all agree that gold's going higher, regardless of these different views, regardless of these different ideas. <laughs> And I think you also have to look at history. You know, 1971, we got off the gold standard. What did we do in 1973? We created a petrodollar to create synthetic demand for that dollar to keep the Gulf states in love with our dollar. Well, that's also breaking down. And the COMEX was created in 1974 to put a permanent boot to the neck of the gold prices. There you have it right there. Boot to the neck. That's what the COMEX was for. Supply and demand. The COMEX is having real pains. So there's all these things happening right now, and you yeah. spend a lot of time on each of these things, but they all are massive implications for the gold uh, price and to, the U.S. dollar. Uh, okay, we're going to move along now. This is Brad Garlinghouse, uh, Paris Blockchain Week. A lot of stuff was coming out um, from the Paris like video and, and photos and stuff. This one right here, I want to uh, give a shout out here. That's Brad Garlinghouse, of course. And then uh, we got the uh, Genic guys. That's Fabio. I've met him two or three times. Met him in Vegas. Met him in, uh, went out to Los Angeles because Sologenic is the company he's with that also founded Corium. And that's who that is right there. That looks like a Brad Garlinghouse bodyguard standing over here. That guy looks, he's a big old dude. He's not as psycho looking as the bodyguard guard, uh, Brad Garlinghouse had at uh, XRP Las Vegas last year. I would not want to make that guy angry. Now, here's another clip right here. Wait, no. This guy may not be a bodyguard. Maybe they're safe inside of this little area. The bodyguard might be standing five or ten feet back. Anywho, all good, good folks. Um, let's see, here's a picture of them in front of the Sologenic booth. And there, there's again. All right, cool. Um, and then there's, there's the XRP Ledger booth. Look at that. All right, um, let's see if there was something else I wanted to show you. Yeah, I was just gonna show you this. Partners, Founders, Summit, Ripple. Um, so, looks like there is a lot going on there. And here's a clip of Brad Garlinghouse on stage. I, I, I told David this backstage. When friends of mine ask me, hey, I want to invest in crypto, how should I do that? I always say, like, invest in a basket. I'm not saying just buy Bitcoin or just buy XRP. I'm saying you want to invest in a, a basket and have diversification. So, look, I think there will be other ETFs. Unfortunately, I think it's going to take a little bit of time because the United States SEC is fighting that. But I, I think one of the things that people don't fully understand that uh, they haven't really paid attention to, in the United States, there's only two cryptos that have regulatory clarity. Bitcoin, and because of the fight we have with the courts, XRP has regulatory clarity that it's not a security. And so that, that is, I think, it's a differential. I think it does matter. To answer your macro point, but there will be other ETFs in the United States I hardly predict the timelines. I don't know how hard Gary Gensler and this SEC will fight. There you have it. And then this was another interest. This one was really interesting. Watch this. The most macro view, <clears throat> I think many of us are believers in the stablecoin market, right? As a bridge between traditional finance and decentralized finance, stablecoins, I think, play a very important role. Uh, the, the the market itself today, as I think we all have seen, is about 150 billion dollars. Uh, the U.S. dollar stablecoins, by far, is the, the dominant. Uh, you know, some, and certainly I'm one of these players, believe that that market at 150 billion today you know, is forecast to be somewhere around two and a half to three trillion in about four or five years. So that's a 20x growth. 20X. Uh, I think there's going to be a bunch of different players. Uh, and I look, I think Tether's going to continue to do well. Circle's going to continue to do well. Uh, I think there's a role for Ripple to play in that. 
given our focus on the kind of infrastructure level. Uh, and look, I also think, and we wouldn't do this unless we thought it was going to be very good for the XRP ledger. Uh, as you have seen stable coins launch on other layer ones, you've seen liquidity in that layer one grow. Our, our ah, you mean like um, Bitcoin? Tether. What has Tether done for Bitcoin, folks? What it's doing is to grow liquidity in the XRP ledger. So we think this as a good opportunity for Ripple, but an even better impact on the XRP ledger. Well, looking forward to that for sure. Uh, what? You know, what are the, the, the stepping stones to launching a, a, a stable coin on the FBI? Well, one of the, I mean, one of the most important pieces of a robust stable coin is really banking partnerships. And so, you know, a lot of the questions we got when we announced last week were questions about, you know, how we're going to manage audits, how we're going to manage attestations. Our goal is absolutely... Pretty darn interesting stuff. Um, I'm trying to decide what I'm going to put the rest of this video may as well keep going um so this is this is uh senator tim scott apparently one of the good guys he's uh he's talking about the problems over in um with the problems with like iran and how uh basically he's saying all you congress people here it's like you've got you're trying to make this about digital assets when it's it has nothing to do with them because you're wanting to rein in digital assets and you're using Iran and sanctions and all that. That's what Elizabeth Warren's doing. She's using sanctions and all those different things for AML and all that as an excuse to crack down on cryptocurrency. The bottom line is this, that if $35 billion represents the export of oil from Iran, none of which is purchased using digital assets, Having a conversation simply and exclusively about digital assets misses the elephant in the room that every single time we make it easier for the Iranian regime to receive resources from the United States in cash, pallets of cash, or through electricity. Remember when Obama sent them a pile of cash in the dark of night, just handed it to them? It was used euros or pallets license. Of cash. We put more and more Americans and our allies in harm's way, and that includes Israel. Uh, and so for us to have a conversation, that sounds like a digital asset comp. All right. And then um, now I'm, I'm going to I might continue this uh, later. I just wanted to see if I needed to hit anything else. Here's Patrick McHenry on stable coin legislation. What What are your goals in the remaining months? Um, do you think we can get the bills through? Yeah, I, my hope is to to get policy enacted into law. I think we can get uh, I think we can get uh, our stable coin policy set through and signed into law. That will be the first sign that there is hope and that there's there is bipartisanship when it comes to this digital uh, this world of digital assets. Number one. Number two, uh, I, I believe we can create some level of clarity by a definition, which would then codify a property right that all of you know to be true, but we need to have federal law define it correctly and to make sure that uh, your property is protected. Um, and so I think we can do those two things th this year. I've got a number of other policy bills, digital um, uh, data privacy, uh, is, is, you know, really uh, an update to our data privacy standards for the financial realm is, is really desperately needed. Uh, it's a major priority of mine to, to push that. Um, and then to make sure that we have um, uh, greater clarity around uh, those that are trying to invest in small businesses and, and have new investment uh, opportunities. Those are there's a set of priorities there that I'm going to try to see through. But uh, if we can get uh, clarity around digital assets, that, that is going to be the biggest win of my uh, 20 years in Congress. It is not stable coin legislation, folks. It's tokenization of real world assets legislation. That's what it really is. That's what this is really. About. How did BlackRock decide? Now, I wanted to show you folks because um, I've seen Robbie Mitchnick on stage and they're, they're getting you to look at the, at the fool's gold, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum, the same standard thing. But I want to show you folks this right here. These people, and they've got Pompliano, Pompliano's got him on stage. In other words, this guy that worked at, at, at uh, Ripple goes to 
he, knowing how the XRP ledger works to the extent that he can do an, uh, an XRP uh, va valuation of price with Susan Athey. That's how well versed Robbie Michnik is. But when he gets on stage with Anthony Pompliano, and when I say Anthony Pompliano, I do mean X mit quotations, X military intelligence, Anthony Pompliano, they continue to tow the Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum thing and here there he's talking about how BlackRock's journey was a six or seven year journey this didn't happen overnight well the problem for that comment is that I was around in 2018 <clears throat> and I remember telling my audience that Larry Fink was BSing them over what he says in the second part of this clip that I'm going to show you so the first part is Robbie Michnik, like a week or two ago, talking to Pompliano. In the second clip, I went back and found it, is 2018 Larry Fink, his boss. How did BlackRock decide that you guys wanted to get into the Bitcoin game? Uh, well, we didn't just wake up one day and make that decision. Um, I think that, you know, you look at our journey, it goes back really now uh, six, seven years. The level of interest that we had from our client base that was consistent and enduring even through the bull and bear market cycles, we saw that very clear pattern that our clients were increasingly interested in this and increasingly frustrated by uh, the availability of efficient, turnkey, convenient, secure exposure solutions uh, with which to get into this space. Don't your clients want crypto exposure? No, I don't believe any client has sought out crypto exposure. Really? Yes. Well, you can but tell. You can just tell by his facial expression he's not telling the truth. At some point, they might. Do you need to be prepared? I, I don't. At the moment, no. It's I, interesting. Yeah, yeah, Goldman Sachs is building out a cryptocurrency trading desk. Morgan Good. Stanley is. Well, I'm not in the trading. trading Morgan's doing the same yes, thing. Yes, because they there are there's elements of people who are looking to trade it. I have not heard from any one client they're looking to and to. That's not what Robbie Mitchnick said. He said they've been planning this for six or seven years because they kept hearing for, from clients uh, uh, to buy a cryptocurrency at this time. When it when it becomes more legitimatized, when it has the true. Uh, true open nature of it that you identify who the players are on both sides uh, that's when we'll probably look at it as an alternative um, as an alternative to all currencies but um, I have right not, now you are aware that you are what do you mean just studying it we're studying it we're looking how they perform we're looking at that type of data to understand it as we we're planning our custody while we tell you that we're not interested in it how about that oh look Partners, top sponsors at Paris Blockchain Week, XRP Ledger, Stellar, and Circle. How about them apples? I just bought some XLM this morning, by the way. True story. Now, um, we're going to go into um, DAIXRP.com, and we're going to talk about several things. One, I'm going to show you the video that everybody on in the united states of america should be demanding that there be an investigation everybody don't care what side of the aisle you're on because if this is let is is if this video if this country lets stand what's in this video we don't have a country and i i think there's a lot of us like me who wonder if we do have a country anymore if the bad guys have just completely taken over now speaking of that XRP Las Vegas, I wanted to uh, cover this, but then in my group, I'm, I'm going to talk about several things. I'm going to talk about XRP Las Vegas because I now have a discount, discount another di a second discount code just for people in the group. Um, and so I wanted to make, I, I'm not going to say what it is out here, but I do have one, okay, because I was asked not to say this is, this is a significant discount for many of you. Come in DAIXRP.com, and I've already posted it in there, but I'm going to go over it. Um, and all the links to XRP Las Vegas are, are in the, the description of this video. The discount link that I currently have for your tickets is in the DAIXRP.com. But now, today, we're, we've added another discount code for one of the events. 
I'll get into that in the in the group. There's only 22 days left, folks. Now, before I go in the group, I'm also going to be talking about this. Something started to bother me. Stephen Narioff, you know, we had already uncovered Ethgate. Ethgate, when I hear Ethgate and when you hear Ethgate, we don't even think about Stephen Narioff. Well, here's what we think about because Ethgate was uncovered before he even showed up. Ethgate is Bill Hinman, Jay Clayton, give Ethereum a free pass along with all the people that we uncovered. And then they turn around and they make sure that Ripple gets sued before they leave. The, it's, Ethgate is regulatory capture. It is trying to um, pick winners and losers and it is not giving this industry a level playing field. Then along comes Steven Narioff. Now, he may be, I, I consider Steven Narioff to be kind of like a branch of Ethgate because what it was going on with him was going on simultaneously with a lot of what went on. But when I think of Ethgate, it's what I just described. Now, and this is something that I, I spotted yesterday and, and I literally went to Steven Narioff um, at I, I was start, I'll tell you, here, here's the gist of it. I was watching, you know, recently this video. Let me see if I pulled it up. Anyway, James O'Keefe had done his video. Is it this one? Yeah, this one. Recently he did this video and he did the spaces with Stephen Narioff. And he said he did, James O'Keefe did say that there was going to be part, there was gonna, this was the first part. So, anyway. And then I saw James O'Keefe yesterday do a write-off, a, a write-up on on uh, what had happened. He had a timeline for Nary off. He had a whole, he had the whole thing. And I kept seeing these things, and I'm not hearing anything about Bill Hinman or the SEC versus Ripple or what went on there. I'm hearing a lot about Stephen Nary off. And so anyway, my point is this: I was starting to see a pattern, and I tweeted about it. It's right here. I, I, I said it right here. Everyone needs to pay close attention to James O'Keefe coverage of Ethgate. I'm starting to notice a pattern where the focus is only on what happened to Stephen Narioff, which is important and we're glad to help. And we have helped a lot. But I'm getting a divert attention away from Hinman and the SEC versus Ripple regulatory capture vibe. I don't think it's really being brought been brought up, okay? So I put this out. Stephen Narioff immediately responded. I'm covering his response here. Others have determined the order of events, but yes, digital asset investor is correct. I'm as committed as ever to hold these account those accountable. Ethgate is the why of my prosecution. We have the same objectives. Frankly, I don't care for the attention never did before, despite my contributions to crypto hits. Uh, why they were able to discredit me? I'm doing this because I promised myself I'd hold everyone accountable. Um, uh, I, and I, and I am in no way, no way benefit from da, da, da. Anyway, so then he says, I also never forget the XRP army embraced me. Okay. This is fine. His, his thing. And I, and I, I told Stephen Narioff point blank. I said, I'm a thousand percent behind you, but only if this isn't just about Stephen Narioff and his case, there's this XRP army did a lot of of work. None of this happens without the XRP Army, folks. Simple as that. The whole the XRP Army changed the entire crypto landscape. Period. With Ripple and and with John Deaton and all that. There's a lot of people that were involved. We will not yield and and sit around and watch Stephen Narioff or anybody take all the credit and make it all about them. That's not going to happen. Other and I told him point blank, and he and and. Stephen Narioff, to his credit, he was very responsive and he, and he said, no, that is not the case. We're going to cover it all. He said, James O'Keefe is going to, is, is, it has wanted, I don't know if he said James O'Keefe, but he said people wanted to have a timeline and it, it's in stages. And so I was assured that, yeah, the Ripple, the, the SEC, all that what really is Ethgate is going to be taken care of and covered and all that. And it'll be a big deal when James O'Keefe does. And so today, you're going to see James O'Keefe. This is part of what they're doing on in this spaces today with Mario Nawfall. It's at 5:30 p.m. I'm assuming that's Eastern time. Okay. So now we're going to go into the group, and I'm going to 
uh, tell you more about XRP Las Vegas and the, the discount we're talking about. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. I just realized, wow, I went 24 minutes. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry, YouTube. Um, okay, I forgot where I was in the thing, but that's okay. The important thing is you know I'm not a financial advisor. So anyway, going into the group now.